So I am delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, Research Connects webinar. My name is Dr. Sarah Wu, and I'm the newest member of the Research and Knowledge Mobilization Team here at the Alzheimer's Society of BC. And as part of my role in the society, I make research more accessible by connecting researchers and experts in the field. I'd like to introduce to you our guest speakers, Dr. Khalid Abdul Rahman and his students, Elaine Yang and Sanaria Aljaf. So Dr. Abdul Rahman is a registered pharmacist and assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Pharmacology and Therapeutics in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. He received his PhD from the University of Calgary and, is, and has developed a research program that focuses on targeted pharmacological interventions to slow the progression of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, Elaine is a fourth year pharmacology undergraduate student in Dr. Abdul Rahman's lab. Her research interests are centered around neurological disorders. She's currently working on potential drugs for Alzheimer's disease that works through the M1 acetylcholine receptor, as well as new monitoring technology to improve brain injury management in the intensive care unit. And finally, there's Sanaria, a recent PhD student, also from Dr. Abdul Rahman's lab. She completed her bachelor's in pharmacology at the University of Westminster and later pursued a master's in neuroscience from the Imperial College London. Currently, Sanaria's research focus is on the role of a molecule called metabotropic glucotamine receptor subtype 5, which acts like a signal receiver in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. Um, as Sarah introduced me, I am Khalid. I am an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Pharmacology and Therapeutics uh, at the Faculty of Medicine. So the uh, Department of Pharmacology is a department where we study um, how the drugs function. And um, I have developed over the past um, few years um, a deep interest in understanding um, how like how the disease how the neurogenerative diseases which i focus on alzheimer's disease and Huntington disease we develop an interest in understanding how they progress and whether we have novel targets that we can use to try to slow this progression um before i get started um i would like to first acknowledge that our lab is located in university of British columbia point Grey campus uh, so we acknowledge that being um, the land of which we gather is a traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam uh, people. Um, our lab, uh, we start, we, I started my lab in University of British Columbia uh, about over, a little over a year ago, so about 14, 15 months now. Um, and, and this is a group I'm very proud of everybody. Um, we have two representatives from our group uh, today, Elaine and, and, and uh, Sonoria. Um, and I decided today to, uh, uh, to hand it over, to hand the presentation to them so that you guys can feel the enthusiasm of, of the young researchers um, about um, understanding Alzheimer's and um, developing new tools to try to slow um, the progression. Uh, before I leave that, I would like to acknowledge the funding agencies and, and uh, of course, Alzheimer's Society of Canada. I'm supported by um, a new investigator grant from Alzheimer's Society of Canada that helps us uh, drive a lot of our um, research. And uh, we're truly uh, honored and um, privileged to receive this funding and also from Michael Smith to support my salary um, and the department. Um, our, our lab, as I, as I explained, uh, we like to study new targets um, uh, and try to test new drugs working on these targets and see whether they are um, able to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we are, our work is not on the clinical side, so we don't do work. Um, we do some work in, in human um, postmortem brain tissues, but most of our work is happening in mice. So today, Sonaria and Lean will be talking a lot about how we test uh, memory in mice and how we give the drugs to mice. And I, and I hope you guys enjoy this and, and get to know um, our research. With that, I think I will stop here. I'll be, I'll be in, in, in the presentation and in the talk. And if you would like to ask any, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. But I will uh, give the floor to Lean, who is a fourth year um, undergraduate student in my lab, joined the lab about four months ago and um, 
and uh, she'll be she'll be starting um, off with um, uh, some introduction, and um, I will be talking about the work that we do in the lab, and then Sanaria will be also uh, talking, who is a PhD student in my lab, will be talking about um, some of the work that we do in the lab. Eileen, the floor is uh, it's yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so we're going to start off the presentation today just looking at what Alzheimer's disease is and sort of as researchers how we really see the disease. And what we're really interested as researchers are things called pathological hallmarks, which is what really differentiates between somebody who does not have the disease, who is normal, and somebody who has the disease. So what's present there that really is different. And so there's really two major things, one called beta amyloid plaques and the other called tau tangles or neurofibrillary tangles. And so just to orient you guys a little bit, in the normal brain, we have healthy neurons, which are the cells that make up the brain. They look something like this. They're healthy, they're interconnected. However, when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, you have these accumulation of these molecules. There's two types of accumulations. And these accumulations really disrupt the health of these neurons and the way that they are able to signal to each other, which is essentially how we're able to think. And what really happens once these accumulations start to build up for a long period of time is that you have death of the neurons. And if you look at a normal brain like this, you have really healthy neurons, you know, making up all of the brain. But then when you do get the disease, we have atrophy, which is the death of these neurons. So what's also really interesting about Alzheimer's disease is that for a long period of time since we started studying it, females have had a higher prevalence of the disease. And this is the same looking at BC statistics as well as Canadian statistics as a whole. Females experience a higher incidence of Alzheimer's than males. And what is really being done at the moment is we have two types of drugs or two major categories. One is called anticholinesterase inhibitors, and the other is called anti-glutamatergic drugs. And these names essentially just mean what system that drugs are targeting. And these two systems have been shown to be impaired in Alzheimer's disease. Um, the two major drugs under anticholinesterase is donezepil, donepezil and galantamine. Um, you guys might be familiar with these drugs as well as mimantamide under anti-glutamatergic drugs. However, the problem with targeting these, uh, these two systems is that it really only treats the symptoms of the disease and it's not really able to get at the pathological hallmarks, which we I was speaking up about before, such as the tangles and the accumulation of those molecules that is truly disrupting uh, the functioning of the brain. These are only able to um, slow the progression of the disease and try to combat that from another system point of view. However, it cannot stop the disease completely or reverse anything. That is not to say that it's not useful. It is able to prolong independence and uh, alleviate some of that pressure on both people with Alzheimer's and their caretakers. However, another major uh, limitation of these drugs is that they do have side effects, common ones being nausea, um, gastrointestinal disruptions or shakiness, and even in worst cases, seizures. And so what's really being done in order to combat these, there are some new promising drugs, the major category of these drugs being antibodies. And what antibodies really do is that for a neuron that's being disrupted by these tangles of molecules that's accumulating, the antibodies actually attach to these tangles of molecules and speed up their removal in the body and, and help break them down. And so by doing this, the cell or the neuron is actually able to recover their function and be able to function well again. And what really is happening is that this is able to slow disease progression or perhaps stop it altogether. And the two major antibody drugs at the moment that are available is lecanemab and aducanemab. However, they are limited by side effects as well. The studies have shown that they induce brain swelling and in worst case scenarios, bleeding in the brain as well. 
However, new drugs are currently still being developed that are also antibodies. For example, donanumab, which is in phase three, and has shown to have less side effects compared to previous. So, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel somewhere here. However, we are looking at some other things in our research team, which I will pass on to Sonaria to introduce. Thank you, Irene. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm going to briefly discuss um, what um, receptors that we're interested in in our lab. So the receptor that we're, uh, the family of receptors that we're interested in are called the G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCR for short. And they're actually responsible for almost all aspects of human biology. So at taste, smell, vision, and memory, they're all involved in uh, some form of the G-protein coupled receptors. And they actually are targeted, the drugs that are targeted uh, by these receptors, they're about 30 to 50% of clinically used uh, drugs. And they're implicated in numerous diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk about a specific uh, G protein coupled receptor um, that was uh, looked at by Dr. Abderhaman's uh, previous lab. So MGLUR5, or metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, um, it's a molecule that's found in the brain. And uh, once uh, a molecule is bound to that receptor, it causes, um, you know, memory and learning um, functions. But what we found is that a drug called uh, CTEP, uh, it's a new drug, uh, it's orally administered, and it's highly selective for uh, MGLUR5. Uh, it's been, uh, so MGLUR5 has been implicated in Alzheimer's disease, and this drug has shown that when it's bound to the receptor, it improves the uh, cognitive dysfunctions that we see in Alzheimer's disease mice. And it's a long duration of action with this drug, which means we don't have to give it um, consistently. We can give it um, in a longer period. So it's orally administered and it's tolerable as well. So with the research design of the study, they wanted to look at whether the treatment, which is CTEP, improves memory function in both male and female Alzheimer's disease mice. Um, and they are given this uh, drug in chocolate pudding. And then memory assessment of these mice were done after 12 weeks of treatment with CTEP. And what was found is um, we tested, sorry, we tested the memory function um, in mice by using a test called the no Novel Object Recognition Test. And it's a really cool and interesting um, test that tests recognition memory. So what normally happens is in day one, we introduce the uh, mice to two similar objects, and we just allow them to explore those two objects. And then in day two, we actually change one of these um, objects into a new object, and we allow the mice to explore both objects again. Mice have an innate curiosity, so um, they'll remember a familiar object and will want to spend more time with a new object. But what we found with Alzheimer mice is that similarly, we put them in a box with the same two objects um, in day one and allow them to explore. But in day two, when we expose these mice to a new object, um, they don't recognize the previous object, which is the green circle, and they just spend the same amount of time with both the new and the um, old object. Then we looked at uh, memory function in a uh, water maze test, which I think is probably the coolest test um, that I studied. It's um, you, There's a platform and it's filled with uh, water, um, and then you put like a small platform in, in the water that's submerged and you allow the mouse to uh, swim through and find its way to the platform. And normally what is supposed to happen after training is that it takes them a shorter amount of time to reach the platform as they remember where the platform is located. Uh, but what we found is with Alzheimer mice, um, it, they take the same amount of time to find the platform as they did from day one to day uh, four. So as I said, CTEP does in fact improve memory and it also found, 
uh, that there's a reduction in the accumulation of the toxic um, amyloid protein that Elaine was mentioning in the beginning of our presentation. But what was also found, and it's super interesting, is that CTEP is actually ineffective in female Alzheimer's mice. So even if female mice were administered CTEP, their cognitive deficits were still the same. There were no improvements um, in the tests that we did, the behavioral tests that, sorry, Dr. Abdelhaman did, but it was uh, effective with male mice, which then prompts the question, how about females? So how does Alzheimer's disease Oh, sorry. <laughs> Another thing is the, um, yeah, the, I'm just talking about the female mice though. Yeah. The, so with the female mice, it's what is, how is good Alzheimer's disease mediated in Alzheimer's disease? Um, with this study, it had an overwhelming media coverage. So Dr. Adrahman was interviewed by the Dutch Nat National News. He was interviewed by CBC and Radio Canada. And it was also um, in the Science Signaling um, article, which just shows how um, interesting and novel this idea is that um, MGLOR5 works in a sex-selective manner. Um, and now Elaine will talk about... Um, what was done in female mice and seeing how the pathology of Alzheimer's uh, works in that sense. Yeah, thank you, Sanaria. So then the study showed that unfortunately the drug we used wasn't really effective in females. And of course, this is actually a huge cohort of people that do struggle with Alzheimer's. And the question that's really prompted is what about females? And instead, we looked at another type of receptor called the M1 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor that is also involved in memory and learning. And this is a new drug that we looked at. It's called VU0486846. Um, it's a little bit more of a complicated name, but essentially it has a lot of the same things as CTEP, which is the drug scenario was previously talking about. It's able to be orally administered, which makes it a lot easier for people who are taking these drugs. They don't have to do any sort of needles or any of that sort of stuff. It's a lot easier that way. And it has fewer side effects compared to previous candidates. In addition, it's also highly selective for the receptor that we are trying to target, uh, previously mentioned, the M1 receptor. And the nice thing about being highly selective is that it really doesn't affect the other systems, which will produce side effects. And it's the reason why this drug has fewer side effects in the first place. So then the question we really wanted to answer is, can this drug improve memory function in female mice? So how we looked at it is that we brought a bunch of female mice with modeling the Alzheimer's disease. We put this drug in their drinking water, and then we had them drink this drug for about eight weeks. And then we used the exact same memory tests in order to test whether this drug was effective for Alzheimer's disease. Just to go over it really quickly, this is the novel object recognition test, where two different objects are placed in a box, and then the rat or the mouse is exploring the new object more, in which they don't have Alzheimer's and they can remember the previous object. And then for the Alzheimer's mice, they will explore the two objects for a similar amount of times because they don't remember which one is the previous objects they have seen and which one is the new object. And again, for the swim test, the mouse takes less time to reach the platform when they can remember where it is, and they'll take longer to reach the platform when they have Alzheimer's disease and they can't remember where it was previously. And so overall, we found that using these two tests, this drug was able to improve memory. And in addition, it actually was able to reduce the accumulation of the toxic beta amyloid, which we were talking about. And so just to orient you guys, this is a slice of the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain responsible for converting short-term to long-term memories. And in the slice, when someone has Alzheimer's disease, we can see all of these brown stuff, which is those accumulation of the tangles of molecules, which I was talking about, and it really disrupts the signaling and the normal cell function. However, after we use the drug and then we looked at the brain again, these accumulations was actually markedly reduced compared to before. 
And now really, we have seen this drug was able to improve memory and reduce the accumulation of these toxic functions in female mice. Our next steps is really to determine if this is also applicable for male mice and perhaps male with Alzheimer's in the future. Again, this did experience a lot of media coverage that perhaps there could be a new um, therapeutic for female mice in the future. And we will continue to study and hopefully present again in the future about our experimental results in male mice, something that we are looking at and will look at in our lab. Um, we do have a question from Natasha. Um, she, uh, they're curious to know, how do you get uh, an Alzheimer's mouse or or how, how do you sort of ensure that your experimental group um, has those uh, cognitive features? You want to ask that later? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So um, we um, genetically, not us, but we can uh, get genetically modified um, mouse models. So there are mutations that you can um, incorporate into a, a healthy mouse model that mimics what um, Alzheimer's disease is in humans. Um, and so there are different, actually different Alzheimer's disease models looking at different pathologies. So there's amyloid ones, specifically just looking at amyloid plaques. There are ones that just look at um, tau tangles, the ones that uh, Elaine was mentioning in her um, presentation at the beginning. So it's there are different modifications and changes that you can do to the genes that can then result in an Alzheimer's uh, disease model. Great, thank you, Sonaria. Now, do we have any other questions from, from folks? I know that was a lot to take in and some very interesting results so far. Okay, so we've got a question from Janine. Um, what is the typical timeline from mouse to human research? That's a great question. I can take that. Um, very good question. Um, typically, there's there seems to be a general consensus like that one one uh, <clears throat> one year old mouse is about correspond to forty years old human. So one to forty. Um, but, um, in terms when we, when we go to Alzheimer mice, our mice are usually, we usually, um, as, as Sonaria explained, we do some genetic ma manipulation so that they get the disease so that we can test our drugs or our hypothesis. So they are, they kind of have accelerated disease like just going past their so they are. We typically test them as a younger age, at a younger age, because they do have the disease already at a younger age. Because we have done this genetic switch that makes them sick, um, so we don't have to wait that long. Um, so we typically do the experiments around eight or nine months. Oh, that's so interesting. And and just because I'm curious, and maybe folks would like to know. Um, from a point where you're doing animal um, testing and maybe just a very quick overview of all the steps to get to the point where you are testing on humans we we are as I explained at the beginning we are we are a lab doing what we call preclinical research this is what we call the preclinical research so it's be, clinical research is the, the research that you do in human so preclinical research is anything you do before so ideally, um, what we do when we develop, for example, when there are drug that is developed, uh, we start to test it from, um, we start to test, take the drug, test against some cells, for example, she would see if it's effective. And then if it's effective in cells, we go to small animal models like mice and see if, it work, if it's working or not. And if it's working and promising, then can take that to the more expensive animal models like non-human primates, monkeys, and, um, and then see if it's working. And if it's working real well, then this is this is very promising. Then it can be put forward for uh, for clinical trials. Uh, clinical trials is a long story. It takes it takes, of course, a lot of money and and so many years. But it's it's kind of uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a, like the drug or the candidate has to pass all these kind of um, 
uh, tests in animals and different animal models and uh, and you know monkeys and stuff like this in order to forward uh, to um, to clinical trials. And then in clinical trials, we tested first in healthy subjects, and then we tested in a small group of patients, and then we do it in a bigger group of patients. And then after showing promise in in that particular um, uh, in, in in a lot of patients in different areas of uh, um, of the world, then the drug shows a promise and it's effective, then this is when it gets approved. And then even after it's approved, um, there is a surveillance that happens after it's approved with what we call post-marketing surveillance, which is another stage of clinical trials where um, everybody using the drug, patients, you know, health professionals are required to report any kind of side effects or any any problems with the drugs in terms of if, like its effect or the side effects. Um, and that is also is taken into consideration because we have seen medications that will go out, people start using it and then uh, start to report problem and then they pull it back. Um, so that's in a nutshell how, how, how a drug starts from a molecule to, um, to the market. Wow. So quite the process, but yeah. uh, thankful for that process. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's keep, thank you so much. Uh, so let's keep going, let's see here. Um, uh, how does one qualify for clinical trials? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, so each clinical trial, um, when, when the researcher apply um, um, to get the clinical trial approved, they have to set certain criteria in terms of, for example, um, if we are trying to approve a drug for Alzheimer, then they say that certain age and, for example, a certain disease state, like, you know, a certain level of memory dysfunction is required and many other criteria. And, for example, maybe not using other drug or using other drug depending on the clinical trials. Um, so there are set criteria that are served by researchers, and when it's, once it's approved, um, they will open it up for, for recruitment, so recruit people. And it really depends if the clinical trial, for example, got an approval to be done in the United States only or United States and Canada and Europe. It depends. They start, it, there are centers in, in, in different areas of the world. Um, they start announcing that again and, and um, getting people recruited. But um, it goes through very rigorous criteria in terms of uh, who can be recruited in that trial or not. Um, but they usually announce this. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah, thank you, June, for that question. Um, Anne has got a question. Um, uh, can you say again, what ingestibles cause Alzheimer's in mice? Does that translate to people? Typically, we don't give them anything, but they like the genetic manipulation that is done is usually based on genetic ma manipulation that has been detected in human. So, um, for example, the mouse model that we talked about today, it's called the EPP Swedish mice. And the name comes from the fact that it's um, it's a mutation that was found in a big, very big Swedish families many years ago. They found that the family has um, a big history of, of developing Alzheimer's disease. So they looked into it and they found out that there is a certain gene has um, a mutation. So they mapped this mutation and what they did is they just created the same mutation in the mouse and they found that the mouse has Alzheimer's. So that that's this is what usually um, happen uh, when we want to um, create mouse models. So usually, um, um, a, genetic manipulation that leads based on what was reported in human uh, so that it kind of translate as much as possible to human disease. But in some cases, um, there are models where we, um, there are areas of the world, that, you know, research question where we don't, we don't want to use a genetic tool. So sometimes uh, what they call what they call inducible models. So the models that we induce, and that is usually done by injecting the the amyloid beta that Elaine was talking about in the brain directly, that's usually happened in mice. So you usually inject it in the brain and leave it for some time. 
then the pathology starts to, to spread in the brain and then we start to see Alzheimer's disease. But that's really uncommon. But commonly, we do a mutation in the in the genes or the genome of the mouse of the mouse that is mapped or similar to uh, what was reported in human. Great, thank you, Khaled. That was a that was a great explanation. Um, Janine, sorry, we wanted to follow up with the previous question, and she was uh, wondering what the timeline was from a positive result in mice to being able to test on humans. You uh, sort of covered that, but no, no. Uh, oh. I mean, I mean, Janine is asking about the timeline. I did not. Okay. I actually explained the process without without purposely. You know, like this was done on purpose. <laughs> I, did, I, did not, I did not talk about timelines because it really takes so many years, um, and it's unfortunate. Um, and that that is usually because of a lot of factors. Um, um, it, this is a huge undertaking to go to human trials. Uh, it's a lot of money, billions of dollars, and um, it usually comes from pharmaceutical companies. And they need to be very convinced in order to take this huge undertaking. So that's it. Usually takes a lot of time and a lot of convincing. I mean, the developing a drug from creating a drug to testing in mice doesn't usually take long. It's usually two to three, five years max we can do this. But then when it goes to other animal models, maybe another uh, few years. But then uh, for a company to be able to um, agree to, to to do a clinical trial, map it out, uh, send the approval for FDA that takes ages. Of course, the FDA doesn't approve quickly. Like there are some drugs that usually are approved, um, uh, but uh, in most cases, um, it takes them a lot of paperwork and a lot of time to just give an okay for a clinical trial or a, an okay of a drug to be testing clinical trial. So it, it takes really a long time, um, but process a lot of money and a lot of time. I can't tell you exact timeline, but it, it takes few years, decades. Yeah, there's a, a lot of moving parts that, that have to yeah, come together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fair. Um, okay, we have a question from Anna. Um, are you saying that Alzheimer's is genetic? Is it genetic in people? This is this is a great question, and I thank you very much. Um, I'm not I'm not saying this. Um, I'm saying what I'm saying that there there are forms of Alzheimer's that are genetic, and this is what we were able to detect, and this is why we're able to take this and translate it and and do it in in animal models. But in most cases, it's not. Um, but the problem that we don't know what are the factors, there are so many factors, many environmental factors, other factors related to other diseases that we really don't know and we cannot model it in a system. Um, so that's why we opt for the genetic form of the disease uh, with the hope that that will be eventually uh, be able to uh, give us some clues on how the disease is progressing. Um, but there is a genetic component uh, but also there are other components that we do not know um, and we cannot do, at least so far, we cannot model in a mouse. Uh, but what I would say is um, when you think about the disease, amyloid plaque is, for example, the beta amyloid that we talked about plays a key role. Either you induce this genetically or environmentally, it plays a key role in the disease. So if you're able to, um, to for example, reduce it or clear it from the body, definitely there will be an improvement. So um, this is how we look at it from research perspective. Great, thank you. Um, Anna, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and we have another uh, question from Vita. You showcase two molecules that help with the disease. How do you select them for your empirical research? And are there many others in the wings um, in conceptual research for your for future research? How do you select among these molecule candidates? Uh, this is this is also a very good question. And that's um, that is related to there are many factors in the selection process uh, for the drugs. 
I think uh, we talked a little bit, but let me elaborate a little bit further. I usually look for um, drug that can, we can give orally because that's usually appealing and, and it's more translatable because people will think, okay, if it's like, you know, if it's orally, then we can move it forward a little bit to, uh, to monkeys and maybe human because it's oral because you cannot, you cannot, it's inconvenient to give a drug um, every day by injection or by any other form. Uh, so oral drugs like by mouth, they are, you know, the most loved drugs, like the most common drugs. Uh, second thing is how selective, you know, I have a target. Um, we talked about muscarinic receptors or glutamate receptors today. I want to target, I, I look for the molecule that is very selective to that particular target. Because the problem, if it's not selective, uh, what happens that it affects other receptor and it causes a lot of side effects. This is usually where the side effects come from. So we try to look for something that is uh, oral, selective, uh, can be easily administered in, 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 in mouse models. Um, there are, of course, um, other considerations that are I cannot go into because it's related more to of how the drug work at the receptor level. Um, but this is typically selectivity and and um, and um, uh, oral viability as well, and its ability to induce side effects. Uh, because we're like if we're if we get side effects at the level of the mouse, then I don't think this is going anywhere. So um, so we try as much as we can to uh, uh, to avoid that. Um, uh, how do I select future research? This is a very very good question. Uh, we actually look for the target first, and then we, it's very easy to design a drug, not easy, but easier to design a drug once you know the target. So if, for example, we know that glutamate receptor is, plays a role in Alzheimer's disease, then we start, you know, go to people who work on computer, who are modeling, and then we start creating drugs and make them in the, and we test them. Um, but if we don't know that this target is important for Alzheimer's disease, there is no way we can create a drug, right? Uh, so we look for candidates. That's what we do through our work um, using, you know, mice and cells, try to find uh, what is the target that is playing a key role in the progression of the disease. And then we try to create drugs for it or look for drugs for it. Sometimes we're lucky enough that there are drugs already approved that can work on that particular drug, uh, that particular target, and then we can try it and see if it can, for example, improve this and that, uh, which what we call drug repurposing, which is a big deal right now in many uh, fields, uh, which is trying to find drug that was approved because it makes things easier and moves things faster with the FDA. Thank you. Um, okay, that was a great question. Uh, Jan, uh, Jan has a question. Um, you give the mice Alzheimer's, can you give people Alzheimer's disease? That's a very good question. I haven't hmm. tried before. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically, um, maybe it's possible. Uh, possibly, if if you, if you, um, if you activate certain pathways or mechanisms in the body that leads to um, production, because think about the, the beta amyloid that we talked about as it's a protein that is present in your body, me, you, and everybody. Uh, it just it, at a level that it's not um, toxic or dangerous. But if you make too much of it, which what happens in Alzheimer, then you start to get the disease. And making too much is done through uh, a certain pathways. There are enzymes and pathways in the body that are responsible for keeping this at a certain level. So if you affect these pathways in a way or another, we have drugs that can affect these pathways. You can definitely increase the accumulation of, of, uh, of A beta uh, or amyloid beta, and then uh, possibly can cause a disease. This is all hypothetical. Um, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think anybody looked into this or tried to do it, of course, but, but I, this is hypothetical. You can do it, of course. Yeah, it, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Vida has a question um, around genetic testing. So uh, 
is there a way to check whether a person is at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and if it's widely available? Um, I don't think it's widely available. That's that I'm not sure about, but there are genetic testing that can tell you that there are, um, you have certain genes that increases. I'm very careful in describing this. You have certain genes that will make you at an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, not getting Alzheimer's disease. Um, the reason I'm saying this, because I don't think anybody can tell you out there that this gene will give you Alzheimer's disease at this year. No way. It's a combination of a lot of things happening together. Um, what are these things? We don't know. We know maybe we know one, two, three, but there are hundreds of things happening at the same time causing this, uh, the, the disease, uh, you know, the, you know, the Alzheimer's disease at the end which, at certain age. So you can say that there are, for example, genes in your body that when there are certain factors are present, will likely uh, cause to have Alzheimer's disease. But there are, there are, we have seen also certain individuals have those genes, but they don't have those factors that don't get Alzheimer's disease. So it's a combination not only of the genes, a combination of genes and other factors that can lead to this. So there are genes definitely that increase your risk, that shows that you have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but not getting the disease. Yeah, thank you for making that distinction. That's, that's careful that we understand it that way. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Anna has a question. It sounds like being exposed to chemicals may induce Alzheimer's in mice. What about people? I am thinking of industrial exposures and the work people do or air and water pollutants. Is that a reasonable um, kind of thing to think about? Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I can't say that I'm an expert in this area. So um, I'll, I'll be very careful when I, when I speak about this. Um, there has been so many uh, studies linking few um, either industrial exposures or environmental factors or chemicals to Alzheimer's disease. Um, I, I am not, as a scientist, I am not sure that we have a very solid evidence to say, if you avoid this, you won't get it. I, I don't think, I don't think that exists. Uh, it's all correlations, um, mostly correlations. Um, but there are definitely, as I said, environmental factors that include either industrial exposure or chemicals that you are inhaling, taking, whatever, um, can in tandem work to give you increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease. But this is all based on association studies. The reason, the reason I'm saying this is because I don't think anybody um I've sat down, I said, you know what, today I'm going to expose myself to this and we'll see what happens to me in 10 years if I have Alzheimer or not. I don't think anybody have done this. What we do is we tend to go back and think, oh, this person has been exposed to, to certain thing over the years and now has Alzheimer's. So it's kind of an association uh, that was exposed to this um, and, and got this at the end, got Alzheimer's disease at the end. Is this, is this true a hundred percent? I don't think so. Uh, I don't, I don't think you can make that solid statement, but there are, there are factors as I said, environmental factor that has been linked um, and it's in the literature has been linked to increased risk. Thank you for that answer. Um, okay, we've got a few more questions here and we're almost at three o'clock here. So let's see here. So um, Katie has a question. Is there more pressure and more money being allocated to research with the aging population? Do you see a cure in your lifetime? Uh, great question, Katie. Is more pressure and more money? More pressure, definitely, because of the aging population, as uh, you indicated. Uh, more money, I'm not sure. Where This is what we're advocating for um, uh, as much as we can. Uh, and with your help, of course, we'll, be, uh, we'll raise our voice. Uh, so advocate for, for, more, for more money, because this is, this is kind of there, there is, there is kind of shift in, um, in, in the disease that, like the problems that we are facing at this point. Uh, 
back in the day, we used to um, focus more about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, which is still a problem. But now with the aging population improvement in health delivery and, and, and aging of population, um, now we're seeing a lot of age-related diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So of course we need more, more money um, uh, for this. Do I see a cure in my lifetime? Um, I have to tell you, uh, Aline talked about the amyloid antibodies. This did not exist when I started to, um, we started to do this research um, 15, 20 years ago. And in the past, I would say 10 years, we had three drugs and there are few in the pipeline. I see um, people looked at Alzheimer's disease as a disease that we have to treat the symptoms, like the drugs that are available on the market. But now people see that there is potential for treatment that can slow the progression. Um, very if like not very effective, effective somehow, and they come with side effects. But I trust that in the coming decade or two, we will have better candidates with better efficacy, better effectiveness, and less side effects. This is this is a process of drug development um, that happens like you know that happened over the last century. You know, you start with a drug that is effective somehow comes with a problem and then people st and start to improve until you get a really good drug. Um, so I, I think there will be a cure. Um, I mean, there is a very promising cure um, and, and there will be others coming out because people now started to realize that we need to find a drug that can slow the progression. In my lifetime, um, I hope so. I don't know how long I'll live, but we'll see. But certainly some really promising areas of focus. I think that yep. your presentation is highlighted. So that's that's great. Um, thank you. Okay, so I've got a question from Zitao. Have you done experiments on mice with interventions other than drugs? That's a very good question. Um, we have, um, so in order, for example, for us, uh, the glutamate receptor that I was talking about, how did we know that it's involved in Alzheimer's disease? The first thing that we done not, was not using the drug was actually to remove, genetically remove that particular receptor from the brain. So we removed that receptor through genetic manipulation and we were able to grow mice that did not have this particular receptor. And then we started to see whether they get Alzheimer or not. So that was... This is how we, we start. Of course, this is not feasible to do in humans. So that's why we move to pharmacology uh, or using drugs. Because um, if we're able to find drugs that can you know, uh, affect certain disease process, then probably that would be uh, something more promising and more appealing because you'll not be able to, for example, do genetic maps and manipulation on people. Um, but yes, we do, we do uh, what we call uh, genetic knockout, which is removing removing the target that we are interested in completely. It just abolishes. Um, and then we see what happens. Genetic knockout. I'm going to remember that forever. Thank you. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, Natasha has a question. Um, associations with multiple concussions, family history of Alzheimer's, what would be seen in an MRI for early onset? And if an MRI is is contrast or or not, does it make a difference for detection? Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna confidently say that this is not my area of expertise, unfortunately. I am I am not I'm not I'm not a physician, so I'm, I'm I, I think it's an important question. I'm I'm just not I'm not able to answer that particular question. I'm very sorry, Natasha. Um but um, 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 it's, it's a very interesting question. I agree, but I don't know. Kyle can answer many questions, just maybe not that. We'll leave that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, Jim, um, I have Alzheimer's and given the progression, it can have quite different symptoms at different timelines. How do you measure effectiveness of drugs? Um, this is actually a very good question. Um, progression, um, 
this was a question that I always had in my research. I was like, if, for example, we talk about a lot of drugs, we give the drugs to mice and we see what happens, uh, but we usually give it, at, for example, at certain age. So what happened if we give it earlier? What happened if we do it later? Um, will it be will it still be effective or not effective? And I actually decided to do that experiment one day. And uh, those mice, I treated them for nine months, not three months, nine. And what we found is the drug is was effective in the early stages, and then it wasn't effective in the late stages, which to me was not really surprising. It's there is a certain stage where you know the disease is so progressed you cannot you will not be able to rescue or stop the progression of the disease because progressed so much but when we did the experiment and we looked into the details it turned out it's not that case yes the disease progressed but in fact that particular receptor that we were interested in was not really involved in the disease at the very late stage of the disease it was only involved in the early but was not involved in the late uh, so no matter what you do to try to um, intervene with a drug that works in that receptor, it might work in the early stage, but in the late stage, it won't. Not because the drug is not effective, but because your target is not really involved. Um, so this was actually a paper that we published and it like, got a lot of attention because what I wrote out, what I wrote in that paper, I said, well, I mean, there is an evolution of the mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease, it changes, and we cannot ignore this. Um, and and the dogma of, oh, maybe the drug is not effective because it's late in the disease. No, there is another, there is another side of the coin, that that your mechanisms or the the way the disease is happening is actually different at the late stage. So you're gonna have to approach it differently. So now we are very careful in terms of what we report and what we test. Um, which stage are we at and, 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 you know, whether our mechanism or our, what we're testing is really involved or not. It's a very good question. Thank you. Gosh, that's so interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah very interesting. Okay. Is there an, any understanding or theories at this point as to why females are more vulnerable to Alzheimer's than, than, than males? Yeah. Um, Theories, yes. Understanding, I doubt. But theories, yes, there are theories. Um, some theories were um, around sex hormones. Uh, some theories were around women living longer. Um, these are all theories. Uh, but what I can tell you that from our research, um, what we found, even if we try to use very young mice, like one day old, and we look at their brains and compare males and females, they are different. So that means, um, I don't think it's longevity or I don't think it's sex hormones because there is none at this point. But I think there are really key differences between males and females. And um, and it's, it's important to embrace uh, these differences in order to be able to develop effective treatments. This is my message through almost all the presentations that I always give. Um, I mean, you can come up with a lot of series, but I have done the experiments. I have seen differences with that in the absence of all these series. So there are intrinsic differences and we're trying now to understand we're doing like, you know, holistic approaches, looking into the brain, unbiased look at the brain of male and female, look at the key differences between both in order to understand uh, what could be the potentially the reasons for the differences. Uh, but that's a very good question. And I sort of have a question um, just to follow up. Historically, with these clinical trials, um, do researchers try to have a sample size that's sort of equal male, female, or has there been a bias over time around just studying males? It's unfortunate. The answer is unfortunate. I'm I'm going to answer, but it's unfortunate. Uh, I, I think clinical trials in, I would say, in between the 90s, 2000s, like maybe 80s to 2000s, I really favored using males. This is blunt. 
uh, they were not using um, really um, standardized sample size and 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 between uh, and equal representation. And the reason for this was uh, there was a drug that was developed uh, back in the days, and it was marketed, and then it turned out that it caught uh, caused a lot of birth defects. And once this happened, um, thalidomide, if you're interested to know, uh, this is the name of the drug. It was developed and a lot of birth defects. And once this happened, I think there was a caution um, in terms of including uh, females in the study because of this factor, um, which maybe was you know out of cautious, caution this back then, but I, I don't see justification of continuing doing this. But the, for somehow it, it continued. But I think there is there is uh, there is now a clear understanding that we can do this. So they are doing uh, clinical trials. New clinical trials are being done in in a proper format and proper representation. But yeah, there is a certain period that where this happened, and I can tell you that between within ten year period there were um, eight drugs. Um, Eight drugs out of ten um, came out with problems in females um, after they were marketed, uh, because because they were just because they didn't test it during the clinical trial phase. And now there's also in the basic research that I do, the preclinical research that we do, there's a lot of interest in in including uh, males and female mice, rats, monkeys, and showing the differences. Either it exists or not, as long as we test it, it's it's fine. As long as we report it, it's fine. But the fact that we're focusing our like a lot, like many years until now, many years researcher would do work in male mice, for example, and ignore uh, doing work of females, or do the males and females and, and compile the data together, which is completely wrong. It it happens, it's still reported. There are people like publishing this, but uh, I think I think there is there is some sort of awareness now with a lot of people embracing six differences, showing that there are six differences in all aspects. But I think people have started to be careful. Um, our funding organ, like Canadian Institute of Health Research, now request in the grants to explain why we're not doing testing in males and females, so that people are like get to know that this is something that they have to think about and meaningfully address. Yes, that's great. That's um, so, so important. And and for the social sciences too, we have to justify, um, you know, uh, sampling for, for gender representation as well. Right. So yeah, no, important things to, um, to consider. Okay, uh, Sandra, are there areas in Canada or BC that show more disease presence? So I guess um, maybe geographic factors? Uh, oh, for, for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. I think that the question for uh, Alzheimer's Society of BC. <laughs> I, I don't know. I am not. I'm not like that's a very good question. I have not looked at that. Um, what I know that when I looked, for example, at the data uh, today from BC and from Ontario, because I was in Ontario before coming to BC, in terms of sex prevalence, um, the percentage is very similar. So the mm -hmm. percentage of females higher than males getting the disease is very similar between BC and Ontario. Mm -hmm. But in terms of overall prevalence of the disease, I am I am not sure. Yeah, I think, Sandra, that's a complicated question, just because we're, you, you know, there's immigration factors we have to put into account, you know, rural areas might have a, a higher a older adult population, older population. So then your, your prevalence, you know, prevalence will be higher. So, um, all this to say that that's a load. That's a. It seems like a simple question. It's a loaded it's question. Pretty loaded. I, I, I don't think anybody, and as as Sarah explained, um, the you know areas will be different in terms of the age of population. I think we can indeed standardize these things and look at give you a number value, say, you know what? After correcting for all factors, this is a number for BC. This is a number for Ontario. I'm not sure if anybody have actually have done this. Not aware, at least, of anybody have done this. But it's a very interesting point. Thank you. Yeah, that is a good question. Mm. Um, but we do know from a service and programs perspective that you know um, 
you know, um, people who are who lo are located in rural remote areas, um, there are just more challenges uh, around um, getting support and 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 access to services. So thanks, Sandra. Okay, and maybe we'll just so one more question from Sandra, and then maybe we'll we'll wrap it up. So, um, do you work with several generations at a time? Uh, Which work, uh, sorry. So, so I guess ge several generations at a time. So maybe the age of mice. Um, is there variation in age groups as you, as you do your testing? Oh yes, um, we we look at the age dependent changes in in any of the factors that we look for. Uh, what we decided to do, what I decided to do when I started my lab, is actually to look at. Um, to start observing the changes early on before the disease progress the starts and then when the disease starts and then after it progresses so kind of looking at mice at six months of age nine months uh 12 months 15 months to see how to, mo to map out the progression of for example increase in amyloid um the change in how the blood go to the brain these things um so we, we are indeed trying to be very meticulous about you know, doing a different age group so that we can, you know, we can capture the whole picture. Because as I said, uh, disease changes or evolves with age, with progression, and we want to make sure we don't miss any of that. Good question, yes. That is a great question. Thank you. Okay, so um, if there's no more questions in the chat, maybe we will, we'll, um, and if there's any other comments from the presenters or anything you want to leave, I think, I think, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop talking because I talked quite a bit, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank everybody for, uh, a very interesting and engaging, um, uh, question and answer session. Really enjoyed this. A lot of the things that you uh brought up um i was able to reflect on my research like i i said like i've done this before and this is what we found so that that gives me confidence that you guys really appreciate what we do and and you enjoy the presentation i hope i hope i hope i'm right uh so thank you very much for for your time so i just yeah i want to i want to thank all of you so much for this presentation today it was really informative um, lots for us to think about and such a great job of answering everyone's questions. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And thanks to all of you for joining in for this uh, Research Connect. And thank you so much to our presenters again. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Great. Really enjoyed this. Us too. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thanks for thank tuning you. in. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you all. See you.